Shakespeare understood when he wrote, some say ever against that season comes wherein our Savior's birth is celebrated, the bird of dawning singeth all night long. And then they say, no spirit dare stir abroad, the nights are wholesome, then no planets strike, no fairy takes, or nor which hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is the time. Let us now make room for the hallowed gracious babe as we gather yet again in honor of his story. Is the night before Christmas, is it not? And here in this house gather old friends, new friends, to peel back our calloused hearts and lay down our leathern lives. For at this moment when the world is most cold and raw, we defy it and invite useless visions of sugar plums and infants. We are here to withdraw from the cold and barren world of prosaic fact, if only for a moment that we may warm ourselves by the fireside of fancy. Blessed are you who have vision enough to behold a guiding star in the dark mystery which girdles the earth. Blessed are you who have ears to detect the song of celestial voices, even in the midnights of life. Blessed are you who have greatness enough to see the royalty of infants, and blessed are you who have the wisdom enough to follow new stars and faith enough to believe in them. Let us now gather our hearts in song as we lift ourselves in worship, singing, O come, all ye faithful.
In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the, ki- the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place at the inn. Feast Days, Christmas, by Annie Dillard. Let me mention one or two things about Christmas. Of course, you've all heard that the animals talk at midnight. A particular elk, for instance, kneeling at night to drink, leaning tall to pull leaves with his soft lips, says Alleluia. That the soil and freshwater lakes also rejoice, as do products such as sweaters, nor are plastics excluded from grace, is less well known. Further, the reason for some silly looking fishes, for the bizarre mating of certain adult insects, or the sprouting say in a snow tire of a rocky mountain grass, is that the universal loves the particular that freedom loves to live and live fleshed full, intricate and in detail. God empties himself into the earth like a cloud. God takes the substance, contours of a man, and keeps them dying, rising, walking, and still walking wherever there is motion. On what bright wind did God walk down? Swaying under the snow, reeling minutely, Revels the star moss pleased.
In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah of the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. A Penitent Considers Another Coming of Mary by Gwendolyn Brooks. If Mary came, would Mary forgive as mothers may? A sad and second savior furnish us today? She would not shake her head and leave this military air, but ratify a modern hay and put her baby there. Mary would not punish men if Mary came again. Thank you. 
When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what they had been told about the child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. The Christmas Tree by Patricia Beer. Outside the world was full, plural. Plants and beasts ran and roared. You could say the tree is standing still and dead quiet brought indoors alone. For an hour, the cat waited for it to move. His murderous face is off guard now. The cat is a scrounger from the farm. They do not feed him, he has to hunt. That's what he's for. Tonight, we work at the tree like dressmakers. In the breeze of its faintly healthy smell, light will be rounded up and festooned over it. That's what it's for. It will not be burnt. At Epiphany, we will try replanting it. It may go yellow while we still hope and while the spring grows green.
In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophets, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For, you shall, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you've found him, bring me word, so that I may also pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star was stopped with the child and his mother Mary, they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. B.C. A.D. by U.A. Fanthorpe. This was the moment when before turned into after and the future's uninvented timekeepers presented arms. This was the moment when nothing happened, only dull peace sprawled boringly over the earth. This was the moment when even energetic Romans could find nothing better to do than counting heads in remote provinces. And this was the moment when a few farm workers and three members of an obscure Persian sect walked haphazardly by starlight into the kingdom of heaven.
dull peace. We like adventures, movies that move at a brisk pace, exciting books, thrilling adventures. Who wants dull peace? Those who do not have it. As we enter a time of prayer, consider those words. This was the moment when nothing happened. So much is happening in our day. Maybe a little less would be a gift. Gather your hearts, friends, as we offer up a moment of prayer. We would ask for a little less rather than a little more. A little less excitement, a little less adventure, a little less uncertainty, a little less Worry, a little less fear, a little less anger. How hard would it be not to have to wonder how the day will end? To sit beneath that fabled vine and fig tree at peace, dull, boring peace, to be unafraid. Is that too much to ask? To have a world where we needn't worry, wonder, fear what will come next? Yes, give us nothing for Christmas, Holy One. A time of nothing, of dull peace, of boredom when we can think of nothing better to do than count heads in remote provinces. Remind us. Remind us that peace, true peace, is so desperately needed in our hearts, in our homes, in our towns, in our nation, and in the world. And grant that we might have from time to time a moment when we know it, so that when it vanishes again, as it surely will, we will hasten to find it again. Yes, Holy One, give us nothing. Nothing but dull peace, a little less of everything. And fulfill the promise all of us have always had. Upon this, for this, and with all the other prayers we bring in our hearts this evening, we pray and say, Amen.
Nothing takes work. Like peace, it doesn't happen by us not doing anything. It happens because we do something. That's why we hold an offering. This is your moment to contribute to the labor that creates peace, to create those pieces that together make the whole. Liberty, justice, honesty, care, wisdom. G.K. Chesterton wrote a beautiful poem that I have read most every year, and I will read it now as a prelude to you taking part in the offering to remind us who we are and where we are and why it matters. There fared a mother driven forth out of an inn to roam in the place where she was homeless. All are now at home. The crazy stable close at hand with the shaking timbers and shifting sand grew a stronger thing to abide and stand than the square stones of Rome. For some are homesick in their homes and strangers under the sun, and they lay their heads in a foreign land whenever the day is done. Here we have battle and blazing eyes and chance and honor and high surprise, but our homes are under miraculous skies where the Yule tale was begun. To an open house in the evening, home shall all of us come. To an older town than Eden and a taller town than Rome. To the end of the way of the wandering star. To the things that cannot be and are. To the place where God was homeless. And all of us are at home. I bid you now to make the very best offering you can. To give the God that lives in all of us a home that is peaceful and whole and good. Your offering will now be most gratefully received.
It has been a lovely pleasure to watch the emergence of our bell choir in the last few years as they become not new but established and ever more expert in their work. Choir, they're going to catch up to you if you're not careful. You're going to have to become better and better. Uh, it's been a fairly quiet an almost solemn evening, and that's part of what we expect out of Christmas Eve, a certain solemnity. And yet, at the same time, it is supposed to be full of joy. And anyone who's ever been in a place where a newborn is knows that solemnity is in very short supply, and that families are messy things, even holy ones. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my family, actually about me, and lighten the mood just a little bit. I'll get serious toward the end, but let's start with a little less earnestness. I want to tell you that I know it all begins very innocently, and you all know this story if you're more than 25 or 30. Say you're newly married or in your first committed relationship, and it's Christmas time, and you live in a tiny apartment somewhere, and you can't afford a big tree, so you get a little one, and you put it on a tabletop, and then you have to go and decorate it, so you go to Walgreens or Walmart, and you buy a little string of lights, and you buy a box of ping pong sized ornaments, and you put the little hooks on them. You might buy a star, and as you're shopping, you see an ornament on it that says, the year and you say, let's get it. It's our first Christmas. And you get one the next year or two, and the year after that. And then you get a bigger apartment, or you get a house, so you get a bigger tree, which means you need more lights. And then you have kids, and they bring home the glitter-covered star or the four-sided snowflake, and they go on the tree, too. Then, all of a sudden, you're 65, and the kids are grown, and you don't even buy a tree because there's only two of you, and trying to get it in the house and get it up and not fall down is just not worth it anymore. But you still have eight, count them, eight big plastic bins full of Christmas decorations. Christmas stuff. And you tell yourself, the kids will want it when they have kids. We didn't. They won't. You have no choice but to admit it. You're a Christmas hoarder. You know about hoarders, those people who turn their homes into giant storage compartments. Well, a Christmas hoarder is not that bad. But when it comes to Christmas stuff, let's just say if there were a program, I'd be standing there saying, my name is Fred and I'm a Christmas hoarder. <laughs> and I'm guessing there would be a few people in this room at that same meeting. Am I right? Many years ago in a magazine, I think it was the New Yorker, I saw one of those witty black and white cartoons and it showed the three wise men going through the desert following the star. And the caption reads, Mark my words, Melchior, this is going to get way out of hand. <laughs> Christmas is about stuff. Stuff we decorate with, stuff we give, stuff we eat, stuff we prepare, stuff. It's a lot of stuff. And yes, I know, because I read it to my church last week, the Grinch stole all the stuff and there was still merriment. But those are who's and we are people and we need stuff. We need it not because we need the decorating. We need it not just for the having. We need it for the remembering. This is why we are true hoarders, because the hoarder will say, if I get rid of that receipt or that newspaper, I will lose the memory that goes with that. And Christmas stuff is about memories all over the place. We keep those year ornaments from our early marriage because when we get them out, we suddenly find ourselves transported back to our newlywed days. Because it's hard to think of them, but when we see it, we can go right there. We still have the Santa drawing our 34-year-old did when he was four. It's a really very good mashup of Edvard Munch, Alberto Giacometti, and Harold and the Purple Crayon. We are very proud of it. It's a fine artwork, along with the crocheted and knitting things that greats and grands make while you're not watching. And when we unpack them, 
the memories come back. And suddenly the past is close and all of the things that meant something still do. And I'm betting a lot of you are like that as well. Do you remember the poem that uh, started, the one from Annie Dillard? I love the lines that said, the soil and fresh water lakes also rejoice, as do products such as sweaters, nor are plastics excluded from grace. The Christmas hoarder understands the truth of that. Sometimes the homeliest or tackiest thing is the most precious of all. We have a little plastic Snoopy ornament that showed up, I think, in one tough year, and it holds close to us our survival. Then there's the curled gingerbread man that I cut out as a preschooler and dusted all sorts of glitter on in the 1950s. No one would call them beautiful. No one would care other than me, but they are utterly priceless and have their grace as well. And now I'm going to tell you why. W.H. Auden, in his epic Christmas poem for the time being, written while he was living here in Michigan, by the way, includes these lines that I think capture why we keep the stuff talks about opening the door on Christmas morning and beholding all the stuff and says this is the place where for once in our lives everything became a you and nothing was an it. I'm going to repeat that. Where for once in our lives everything became a you and nothing was an it. It was all alive, wasn't it? If you remember how sparkly it was. It isn't the light, it isn't the smell, it isn't the colors, it's the aliveness of that moment. And that's what the stuff does. It reminds us of that feeling last year, 10 years, 30, 60 years ago. When people ask why we can't have Christmas all year, they're not asking why we cannot have door busters every week or eat roast beast every evening. They don't mean that they want to go to more parties or eat more cookies. I think I've already had more than my fill. They don't want more tinsel and they don't want more ornaments. They say, they mean, they want the feeling that everything is a you and nothing is an it. And this stuff somehow helps to do that. But even with the stuff, it can be hard. When everything is a you and nothing is an it, we have a problem because that means everything matters. Not just the present under the tree, but the paper it's wrapped in. It matters too, nor are plastics excluded from grace, remember. Not just the ornaments, but the infernal needles that get into everything and turn up at Easter. Not just the feasting, but having to clean it all up with the grease and the garbage and wondering why you ate so much and wondering how you're going to eat the rest. It all matters. When everything is a you, everything matters. The baby's being born tonight, homeless, but every night as well. Their mother's wondering about their next meal or their next fix. She matters. Muslims, Jews, atheists, and others who don't care about Christmas and don't believe in it at all, they matter. Mexicans and Guatemalans sitting on our border, they matter. Syrians and Somalis trying to get out from under death and destruction, they matter, even if we don't see them. Men in prison for horrid crimes that they deserve, and those who deserve to be there that aren't, they matter too. Irate neighbors, pompous bosses, indolent workers, drunkards, socialists, racists, line five, PFOS, mosquitoes, millipedes, spiders, and their webs. All of it, all of it matters if you want Christmas to be every day. When everything is a you, there's no looking out for number one because there is no number one. There's just one, us. When everything is a you, there's no winning because you can't abide one of the others you know losing. Heck, if you think about it long enough, Christmas is downright un-American. But we are more than Americans. 
Our stuff reminds us the way a church tries to remind us that we can be more than our stuff, more than our nationality, more than our race or our religion or our gender. We are more than that. And sometimes it actually happens. This year marks the centennial of the end of World War I, and some of you may know the story of back when it started on that first Christmas Eve after everyone had dug into their trenches. Some Germans on one side of no man's land shouted, Merry Christmas, and sang carols to the English. The English replied, Fröhliche Weihnacht, and sang back. And then one of them poked his head up above the trench, and no one shot. And no one came yelling, and then another person, and then in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve, hundreds of men all along the front, not every place, but in many places, came out and they visited their enemy face to face and cut off buttons and exchanged cigarettes, had a drink, shook each other's hand. They dared to see a you where the generals said there was an it. One of them wrote, it, wrote this, I wouldn't have missed that unique and weird Christmas day for anything. I spotted a German officer, a sort of lieutenant, I should think, and being a bit of a collector, I intimated to him that I had taken a fancy to his buttons. I brought out my wire clippers and with a few deft snips, removed a couple of his buttons and put them in my pocket. I then gave him two of mine in exchange. The last I saw was one of my machine gunners, who was a bit of an amateur hairdresser in civil life, cutting the unnaturally long hair of a docile German who was patiently kneeling on the ground whilst the automatic clippers kept up the, crept up the back of his neck. That is what happens when everything is a you. It only lasted a day. It didn't even happen the next year, but it happened. It happened in defiance of generals and presidents' treaties. It happened because they gave themselves permission to see a you wherein it was. The war lasted four more years, but even a single match can give enough light to keep going, keep going in a dark room. It reveals where we are in that moment that it's alive. And we get to keep that and keep going. Do you see what's in the light of the match that's being lit right now? Is there dull peace? Is there nothing going on? Is there something worth crawling through the dark until next Christmas? I don't know what you see, but when I light up the match in my heart, I see you, all of you, and none of you are an it. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found true in thy sight. Thou who art my rock and my redeemer. We come to that most precious part of our ritual when we share Silent Night. This year is the 200th anniversary of its composition and first performance. The choir will now come up onto the dais, and together they will begin to sing and your turn will come. Once we start singing, you'll hear no more words. And you are free to stay here until the match light goes out. And you can return to your life. But take the flame with you. We'll need it for the year to come.